Praise the Lord. If you are there, I said, Praise the Lord. I welcome you to the special combined service today in Jesus' name. And I pray that this period will be a blessing to your life. And that will be doers of the word. Will not be hearers only. Because it's when we do the word, practice the word, live according to the word, the blessing of the word will be upon ourselves and our families. It will be so in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you and bless your name for our combined service today. Thank you for your people, our leaders, workers, and members, and all the invitees, those who are coming for the first time. We pray that this will be an unforgettable, memorable experience in every life in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that you stretch forth your hand to everyone. Bless everyone beyond their imagination in Jesus' name. And whatever will hinder the progress of anyone, we pray that you take that away from every life in Jesus' name. The purpose that you have for us, the plan you have for us, the progress you have for us, we pray, Lord, every one of us will achieve in Jesus' name. Open the windows of heaven. Shower the blessings down. And let your people today discover the path to success and progress, happiness and joy in every life and family. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Somebody shout amen. amen. God bless you. We're coming to an important passage today. And we're coming to this because, well, the Lord himself has uh, spoken this. And the Lord has shown us the way. And I pray that every one of us will have our eyes opened and will see the way that the Lord himself has opened for our progress, for our happiness, for our joy, and for eternal rewards. You'll not miss what he's telling us today in Jesus' name. It's in Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 21. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Here the Lord Jesus Christ is opening a new chapter in the life of everyone there. Many times when we look at the commandments of God, we don't understand and we don't know why God has put that there. And Jesus Christ said, you have heard by them or from them of all time, thou shalt not kill. You know why? Every creature is important to God. You are important to God. I'm important to God. He creates everyone for a definite plan, a definite purpose, and each one should make the progress and accomplish what God has called him to accomplish. And when you look at a man, you look at a woman, wherever that man is, wherever that woman is, and you cut short his life. You've done something to the plan of God. You've done something to the progress that person ought to make, and you have cut that short. And the Lord is saying, if you think you'll do without that man, then I'll have to also terminate your own progress. I have to terminate your own life. I have to terminate everything I plan that you will do. As you look at every man, as you look at every woman here on earth, Look at that man with a definite purpose in life. He may not know, but God knows. And he says, don't touch his life. Don't cut short his life. Because if you do, my plan for the world somehow will be affected. And then I'll have to deal with you because you are dealing with that person who is to carry out a particular purpose. Now Jesus Christ went forward to say in verse 22, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother, hold on there. You see, when, we, when you manifest anger to a brother or to a sister, if that brother knows, 
If that sister knows, there's something that happens on the inside. Instead of concentrating on the goal the Lord has set before him, all of a sudden, it's diverted. All of a sudden, it's depressed. All of a sudden, it's distressed. And the thing you ought to concentrate on, that I am here to do thy will, O God, he cannot concentrate. And Jesus is saying, leave him alone. Don't be angry against him. Leave her alone. Don't be angry against her. Because he says, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Why? You get angry against somebody because you judge him. It's not doing right. It's not looking well. It's not behaving well. It doesn't match the standard I raise up for him. You judge him. And when you judge him, and now you manifest anger as a result of that judgment, it says it is the law of sowing and reaping. You are sowing judgment without mercy. And you are sowing judgment with anger. And it says you'll be in danger. It goes on to say, And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raker. That means an empty-headed fellow. That means a non-entity. That is, he doesn't have anything on the inside to qualify him to live. He says, Raker. You know what you're saying? Huh? You know he didn't create himself. And you know God created him. And you say empty-headed fellow is a reflection on the creator. It's a reflection on the person who has created him. And so he says, because you put that negative touch and that negative look and that negative attitude to the creature of God that God has created, you'll be in danger of the council. It's not, you know, the council here. There was no council of the Pharisees that will sit upon a man that said Rika because they themselves, they said more than Rika. They said Jesus Christ was casting out devils by Beelzebub. So they're not qualified to sit in a council. It's talking of a council of heaven, the council of the Almighty himself. And then it says, Whosoever shall say, Thou fool, you know, you look at the person created by God, maybe a little child, maybe an adult, a grown-up man, and might be anybody at all, a Christian or non-Christian, and all you can say, you cannot see anything good in that man, you cannot see any prospect in that man, you cannot see any future, all you can say, you sum up everything together, all you can tell is, Look at him, he's a fool. He's coming out of the hand of the creator. He's coming from the creation of God. And then you say, this is all God can make of you, thou fool. You reflect on God. And because you reflect on God, he says you'll be in danger of hellfire. He says, therefore, having belittled God, therefore, having spoken against the creature of God, therefore, have you reflected on the creation of God? Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, what do you see? God, God is saying concerning you. How you see looking at you as you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember, thou rememberest that thy brother has ought against thee. That word ought is something next to nothing, next to naught. And when you put an N, Beside that ought, there comes a not. So the ought is next to not. It's next to nothing. The fellow has something a hot in the heart. You've damaged his mind. And you've distracted him. And you've destroyed him. If he believes what we're saying, that he is also a empty-headed fellow, and he gives up and he says, there's no point trying. The people who know me and the people who see me, they say, Reka to me. They say, I'm empty. They say, I'm an entity. You've destroyed a lie. 
If that person thinks about what you are saying, if he doesn't understand that the final word and the final verdict comes from the Almighty God, if he believes what you are saying, thou fool is doing something. He said, I don't know whether this is right or not. After all, I'm a fool. And he's going somewhere. He's not sure of himself. There is indecision in his life because he says, I don't understand whether this will amount to anything or not. After all, I'm a fool. There's somebody that is carrying a heart about because of your word and because of the things you say and the things you do. He says, therefore, when you remember that somebody has ought against you and you bring your gift to the altar, it says, leave that gift. God is not interested after you have belittled him, after you have kind of uh, negated his creation. He's not interested in anything you want to offer. Now leave that there and go reconcile with your brother. Look at this in verse 24. Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way first first things first reconciliation first things first restitution first things first and peacemaking first things first it says be first reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift looks like the peacemaking the reconciliation and the righteousness makes us fit to offer anything, a voice, to offer anything, our gift, to offer anything, our talent, to offer anything, our treasure unto the Lord. It takes reconciliation first, repentance first, righteousness first. And it says in verse 25, agree with thine adversary quickly. That person was your brother because you've spoken against him now you have not treated him like a brother you've looked down upon him that's not a brother again and you are spoken an empty words to him and you make him feel empty a non-entity a nobody and he's uh, he's a fool now you make him your adversary and he says agree with an adversary quickly by repentance by righteousness and also by reconciliation and by that restitution, you make amends and it says, while thou art in the way with him, when well, you can still see him. It says, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge and the judge deliver thee to the officer and thou be cast into prison. You know what he's saying? He's saying there is the judgment by the council is saying that the judgment of hellfire and if you do not set your lead at the right time at the earliest time possible it says you're even cast into the prison to start with that is in your life here there is imprisonment and there is captivity and you cage yourself because of the anger unresolved and you cage yourself because of the bad language unresolved and then he says, Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the utmost farden. As we look at those verses I've read to you now today, we're looking at the word of God, the believers progress with total freedom from anger. The believers progress with total freedom from anger anger if there's any problem we need to address in our families is the problem of anger you know as we talk about this and as we look at this passage we're saying this teaches restitution you're right if anybody has a second wife he must make restitution you're right but my brother my sister look at this whole congregation how many people have a second wife? You might find not up to 1% of the congregation. And so if we stay here and we only interpret that word by if you have a second wife, a third wife, make restitution, we're only talking to less than 1% of the church. 
if we come over here look at Zacchaeus he said half of my goods have given to the poor I will give to the poor and if I've taken anything by wrong accusation from any man I restore him in fourfold those who have stolen money and those who have taken property belong to other people we need to restore that's right that's right but you know if we only depend on that if we only interpret this passage on that basis that you've stolen money you've taken money go and restore you'll be talking to less than one percent of a saved congregation a sanctified congregation a bible believing congregation we need to take the whole passage and see today what's hindering our progress and see today what's hindering our spirituality and see today what's hindering the renewal the revival in every life in every family and in the whole church it is this problem of anger we cannot make progress without addressing the issue progress is the believer's birthright when you become a believer you ought to make progress it's your birthright progress in all areas of life progress in the spiritual life progress in the prayer life progress in our worship and progress in our fellowship progress in the family progress between husband and wife progress between parents and children progress in all the arms of the church progress in your professional life you see you ought to make progress in the work you're doing or labor that you are addressing every day progress in our health we need to make progress but anybody who knows the truth he will tell you that anger 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 and all those negative emotions will hinder our progress in our health and then in our personal life in happiness and joy in satisfaction fulfillment anger hinders everything yet no one can have no one can enjoy all round progress in isolation you cannot say all right if anger is the problem i know what i'm going to do i'm going to seclude myself i'm going to separate myself i'm going to live all by myself i will not interact with anybody that doesn't solve the problem because you cannot make progress and you cannot move on without relationship with other people you relate with saints and sinners you relate with neighbors and strangers you relate with friends and foes you relate with the good and the not so good people in life you relate with the truthful you relate with the troublesome people in life the secret of our progress is freedom freedom and thank god freedom has come today i said my own freedom has come today you'll be free you know once you are free from this kind of sin that ties you down because jesus gives freedom and once you are free you are ready to make progress i can see you after the service i can see you running to progress I can see you moving on to progress. And I can see that progress is coming. It will get on you in Jesus' name. But you know, anger hinders our progress. Anger hinders our promotion. Anger hinders our prosperity. Everything depends on each believer. You see, if anger is going to hinder me, that person makes me angry. No, it doesn't make you angry. You make yourself angry. There's freedom in the world. There's freedom in every community. There's freedom of speech. That's why the right at the back of those lorries, let them say. There's liberty for everyone to say whatever he wants to say and to do whatever he wants to do. They don't make you angry. You make yourself angry. And you keep yourself angry. Everything depends on you. No one can make you angry. No one can keep you angry without your permission. And no one can stop. No one can hinder your progress without your consent. That's why today we're looking at the believer's progress with total freedom from anger. You'll be free. Can you be free? Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. I'm reading from the statue. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 
ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Look at verse 36. If the Son, that's the Son of God. If the Son, that's our Savior. Is if the Son, the one that has power to create and to recreate us, the one that has power to transform our lives, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. My time of freedom has come. I said, my time of freedom has come. In Romans chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 18. Romans chapter 8, reading from chapter 6, reading from verse 18. It says in verse 18, being then made free. It's, there's an external force. There is a supernatural force. There is an heavenly force coming from outside yourself to make you free. Being then made free from sin. We became, ye became the servants of righteousness. Verse 22, but now, but now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Chapter 8 of Romans. Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. Looks like Paul, the apostle, is enjoying his freedom and he said, this is me, this is me, whatever is happening to other people has made me free. Can you read that so you can feel how personal it is for the law of the spirit of life? Let the Lord hear you for the law of the spirit of life. In Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Be it confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. Progress from heaven. Progress by the spirit. Progress as the Lord has created you and intended that you'll have progress, it will come upon your life in Jesus' name. Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, you will live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. Amen. Look at Galatians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. Galatians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Stand fast, therefore, when Christ comes into our lives, it sets us free. Every yoke that binds in our emotion, in our mind, in our attitude, in our character, it sets us free and releases us so that we can accomplish what the Lord has ordained will accomplish. And it says, now that you have met Christ, and now that you belong to Christ, stand fast. Therefore, in the liberty, liberation, redemption, wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. All entanglements are broken today. All entanglements are taken away from your life today. The believers progress with total freedom, from anger. Three things we're going to look at. Number one, the danger and the consequence of anger in the heart. The danger and consequence of anger in the heart. Number two, the declaration of Christ on anger in his house. The declaration of Christ on anger in his house house. Point number three, our dominion and cleansing from anger for eternal happiness. Our dominion and cleansing from anger for eternal happiness. Number one, the danger and the consequence of anger in the heart. We're coming to Matthew chapter 5. And I'm reading from verses 21 
and 22. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, well, verse 22. Ye have heard that it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever, and whosoever, and whosoever, anyone, God is no respect our persons, shall kill, shall be in danger of the judgment. Cain was the first murderer. He created a problem for himself, more than for Abel. He killed Abel. That just quickened the time that Abel will get to heaven. He killed Abel. That just fast tracked the moment of the time Abel will get to heaven. He killed Abel. That just increased the time Abel will spend in heaven. And then as he went to heaven, a curse came upon Cain. The injury was more terrible on Cain. In fact, he said, I cannot bear the punishment. My punishment is greater than I can bear. And think about Pharaoh. He said, every child that is born to any of the Israelites, dump him in the river. Those babies, without going through the trials of life, and without going through all the hazards of life, hazards of life, they just went to heaven straight. But the problem is on Pharaoh, because eventually, you know Pharaoh, because he's an adult, and he was going, he perished in the Red Sea, and went from that watery grave, and went to hell with all his chariots. You see, the people who are killed, if they are believers, they go to heaven. And now the person that perpetrated that, the problem is on his side. Look at it now, verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother, whosoever is angry with his brother, without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever is angry, can you picture the fury and the fierceness of Nebuchadnezzar? He was furious. He was angry against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he said, now, he called the most trusted people in his kingdom. He said, bind them. He was angry. And he that fire seven times hotter. He was angry. And then he said, throw them in. You know, those people, when they were thrown in, they don't have any problems. They don't have any problems. And they were not angry. We're not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our confidence is, if it be so. Our faith is, if it be so. Our trust is, God will deliver us. Did he deliver them? Church, I said, did he deliver them? And then the fourth person, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, before his incarnation, he came there and was walking with them. But you know what? It's the man, Nebuchadnezzar, that lost all those mighty men and all those great men. The flame of the fire came out and you destroyed them. It's the person that gets angry, that has the problem eventually. And then eventually you understand what happened to Nebuchadnezzar himself as was turned to an animal. That's why Jesus is saying the angry fellow is the problematic fellow. He creates problem for himself. And then he says, whosoever shall say that reckon shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say the fool shall be in danger of hell fire. And let's look at this. We're looking at Job. I'm reading from Job chapter 18. Job chapter 18. And as we look at Job chapter 18, I'm reading here from verse 4. Job chapter 18, reading from verse 4. He tears himself in his anger. You see that? The one who is uh, manifesting anger and the one who is trading in anger and the one who is swallowing anger and the one who is fuming with anger, the one that has the smoke of anger in himself, is destroying himself. 
He's being more harmed to himself that the fellow is angry at. He tears himself in his anger. Shall the earth be forsaken for thee? Shall the rod be moved out of his places? Let's come to Job chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 2. Job chapter 5. We're looking at verse 2. It says in verse 2, For Ross killeth the foolish man. Wrath killeth the foolish man. It said, seem in the way of destruction. You know, it's always angry, always angry. The brain is affected. It's always angry. His heart is affected. It's always angry. While he is angry, he cannot think of his future. He cannot think of his prospect. He cannot think of his progress. He cannot think of his promotion because anger totally occupies the heart. It's filled with fury and he doesn't have any other thing he can think about. It says in that verse 2, for wrath killeth the foolish man and envy slays the silly man. We're told in uh, Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. And here we're looking at uh, verse 41. Genesis chapter 4, 27. And I'm reading from verse 41. It says in verse 41, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then... What will happen? Say it out aloud. Say it like Esau would have said it. Then will I slay my brother. Hold on. I'll slay my brother Jacob. But she understand. Didn't mommy tell you when you were still little children? You know children, when I was pregnant, there was a struggle inside my tummy. And then I was bothered and worried about this. And I went to God in prayer, and God told me, two nations are inside you, and the elder will serve the younger. He said, don't you remember, this is the plan of God before you were ever born. God made the decision, and he said, I'm going to have a nation through which I will send the light of the watch of God, light of revelation. I'll send it to the rest of the world through somebody that is called Jacob, whose name will be changed to Israel, who will have 12 sons, and those 12 sons will become 12 tribes of Israel. It had been decreed and determined before you were ever born. It's not just because of that transaction of the, of the birthright. And it's not just because of what, uh, you know, uh, Isaac had said. And so saying, I'm going to kill him. No, you'll be fighting against God. Because if you're able to kill him, and those 12 tribes of Israel are totally exterminated, the plan of God for Jacob, the plan of God for Israel, the plan of God for the 12 tribes, the plan of God for the whole world, sending his word to the whole world will not be fulfilled. God is not going to allow you to do that. You can only hurt yourself. You can only destroy yourself. Look at verse 42. These words of Esau, her elder, bro, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. And she sent and called Jacob her, uh, her younger son and said unto him behold thy brother Esau as touching thee does comfort himself purposing to kill thee now therefore my son obey my voice and arise flee thou to Laban my brother to Haran and tarry with him a few days hold on a few days you know, the mother herself that evolved the plan and now said, go for a few days and everything will be over. A few years, everything was not over. Seven years serving for Leah, everything was not over yet. Seven years serving for the other woman, the other wife, it wasn't over. Six extra years, it wasn't over. 20 years, it wasn't over before Jacob came back the mother had died and then when he came back 
Esau had that was coming. You know, he's been thinking, he's been pregnant of anger for 20 years. And he has 400 men. And instead of making those 400 men to do something useful in life, all he was stressing the 400 men for was to do the impossible, to kill and to destroy Jacob. Meanwhile, Jacob had forgotten everything. The person we're angry against has forgotten everything and is making progress. He has two bands. He has children. He's raising a family. And the people that will be the heads of the greatest nation on earth at that time, they are being formed and the man is destroying himself. Anger destroys the person who is manifesting anger. And then it says, until thy brother's fury turn away, until thy brother's anger turn away from thee, and he forget that which thou hast done to him, then I will send and fetch thee from this. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? But you understand, he hindered himself. That Esau hindered himself. We're coming to Psalm 106. Psalm 106, I'm reading here from verse 32. Psalm 106, we come to verse 32. Now we come to a solemn moment. We're coming across now the meekest man on earth at that time. The lowliest man on earth at that time the most spiritual man on earth at that time we're coming to the most privileged man on earth at that time his name moses we're coming to psalm 106 verse 32 they angered him also at the waters of strife he's talking about moses so that it went ill with Moses for their sakes because they provoked his spirit so that he spake unadvisedly with his lips. That's Moses. He spoke unadvisedly with his lips. They angered him. The people had no water to drink and just like they always did, they were always babies, always murmuring, always grumbling, always complaining. They started the whole trick again. And then they mumbled and they said, what are we going to drink? We are dying of thirst here. Why did you bring us out? They started the whole story. And Moses, we have had that before. That's not the time, first time that says such a thing. Why don't you just walk over and neglect them, overlook them? He prayed. And the Lord said, take the rod in your hand. And stand before that rock. Don't knock the rock. Don't strike the rock. And speak to that rock. And the man was angry. Think about this man, a favorite of God. Think about this man, the most spiritual man in the whole land of Israel. Think about this man, the man that consecrated and gave up every imaginable sin for the salvation, redemption of the children of Israel. He got angry, and then he spoke the rock, smote the rock two times, and what that came out is the person that has the anger, that has the problem. The people that wanted water, they got the water to drink. All their millions, all their wives, all their children, they got the water to drink. They had no problem. That's the way they have always been. Huh? And they were babies. They were not going to change. But it was the man that got angry that got into a problem. Although miracle happened, although water came out, the anger hindered the man. And things were never the same again for Moses. Look at Deuteronomy. I'm reading here from chapter 3. Deuteronomy chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 23. Deuteronomy chapter 3. We're looking at verse 23. And I besought the Lord at that time saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth, 
that can do according to thy works and according to thy mind. I pray thee. Here is Moses praying. I pray thee. I'm pleading and asking. Let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain and Lebanon. But the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes. I bore the pressure of that anger. I bore the punishment for that anger. You drank the water, you forgot everything, and I'm still under the shadow of that day of anger. And it says, the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me and would not hear me. It affected his prayer. You know when you have anger, you are manifesting anger, and the person you are even angry about is living his life and, you know, is whistling and singing, and he doesn't know that anything is going on at all. If you wanted anything, it's God what you wanted. And even though you are angry and giving him that thing, you know, the man is enjoying his life, and now you have a problem. The anger hinders your prayer. The anger in us your progress and the anger in us the plan of God for your life. The anger makes you to lose and to miss the great thing you have been looking for that we're going to the land and let my people go and taking them to the land. Now you cannot because of that moment of anger. Anger destroys the person himself more than the people you are angry at but the lord was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me and the lord said let it suffice thee speak no more unto me of this matter speak no more unto me of this matter we're coming to first samuel chapter 20. first samuel chapter 20 and here I am reading from verse 30. For Samuel chapter 20. And we're reading from verse, we're reading from verse 30. For Samuel, what chapter am I looking for here now? And what verse are you looking for over there? Verse 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said unto him, Thou son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Stop there for a moment. Anger does not know how to limit itself to the object or the person you are angry at. Anger is like just throwing spears everywhere. And even people that are not in the picture, the people that are not there, there's no concern for the mother here. And the mother is not an offender here, but Saul was angry. And anger goes beyond your target. And it said, thou son of a perverse, a rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion? And unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness. Ah, ah, look at this one. Now everybody knows the condition of the family of the king. It's not in control. It's not in control of his emotion. And therefore it's not in control of the wife or the child. Everything is in disarray. Anger scatters everything. Your family will not scatter. You know, Satan cannot scatter your enemy. You didn't say amen to that one. Yeah. Your in-laws cannot scatter your family. Yeah. I said your in-laws cannot scatter your family. Yeah. If that family is scattered, it's in your hand. It's in your hand. It's the anger. It's the fury that scatters everything. Look at verse 31. For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul his father, and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What has he done? And Saul 
And Saul, tell me what happened there. And Saul, tell me if you are there. Saul, say it aloud. Cast a javelin to smite him. Hold on, Saul. I thought you said you wanted Jonathan to reign. And that's why you want to get rid of David. And now you have a javelin in your hand. And because he's angry, angry people forget themselves. They forget even their own plan. They forget even their own desire. I want a Jonathan to reign. Remove David from there. And now in the case, in this outburst of anger, he took the javelin, he would have killed even Jonathan. You're walking against yourself. How is your son going to reign? If you take a javelin in your anger and you want to smite him, Second Chronicles chapter 26. In Second Chronicles chapter 26, here we're reading from verse 16, Second Chronicles chapter 26. And I'm reading from verse 16. And when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and within four score priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And he was to Uzziah the king, and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense, go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast transgressed, neither shall leech be for thine honor from the Lord. Verse 19, verse 19, verse 19, and Uzziah, somebody there tell me, was wrath, was furious, he was angry. And he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priest, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. You see, he destroyed himself. He had leprosy at that time, an incurable disease. And it happened to the number one in that nation, happened to that king, because he was angry. Angry people, they hinder themselves. Angry people destroy themselves. Anger destroys the angry person. Anger separates him from success, separates him from happiness. Anger depresses him. Anger distresses him. Anger slows down the brain from positive thinking and progressive planning. Anger scatters the family. Anger makes hatred, strife, revenge have devastating effect on the person himself. Anger hinders prayer. Anger makes the person deny himself of divine favor. And then it causes self-destruction, self-destruction. Look at the man here. He was wroth, he was angry. And the leprosy came over, he said. He himself now was even ashamed. Look at verse 20. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests, uh, and all the priests looked upon him. And behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they thrust him out from this. Yea, he himself hasted also to go out because the Lord had smitten him. And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in a separate se several house. That means a separate secluded house. Being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of Israel. You see, anger destroyed the man. The angry person is less productive. 
the angry person hinders himself from ever reaching his potentials. And there's a great future ahead of you. I said there's a great future ahead of you. I want to ask you a question. What if, you know, somebody was waiting for you and is going to give you a million naira, million dollars. Let's just change to foreign currency now. When you change it, you'll become billions. He wants to give you a million dollars. And then he's waiting for you on that side. And there's somebody here that does something irrelevant and something that is insignificant. And then he wants to make you angry. But your mind, your heart, your focus is on the one million dollars. Somebody is waiting there. And he told you, I'm waiting. I have only five minutes to go. I'm going to catch my flight and then over here will you stay with this person striving and forcing about something will you stay you know you leave that poor man where he is and then you overlook everything and then you are going your way and that future you will not miss it in Jesus name see that's what happens to people the Lord is waiting on the other side the very purpose of your life and the very plan for your life is waiting to give unto you and there's somebody there that is delaying you and tying you down with hunger you see those who manifest hunger like that the, the less talented people will surpass them and the people who are not even up to their own level they will go beyond them in life leave that hunger alone and continue to make progress I will make progress. Somebody there will make progress from today in Jesus' name. It is confirmed in Jesus' name. Progress in your life. Progress in your family. Let that anger, you are greater than this now, that little thing that that person has done, that thing that is insignificant. Put it under your feet and match on it and match on that scene and go to the progress the Lord has made for you in Jesus' name. No more anger. I said no more hatred. No more bad emotion. No more fury. I didn't hear an amen for that one. You will make progress in Jesus' name. How do we solve this problem? How do we clear this sin out? We're going to clear it now away from your heart. We're going to clear it away from your table. We're going to clear it away from your sight. Point number two now, the declaration of Christ on anger in his house. In his house. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 5 verses 23 and 24. Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 23, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother has aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. There, there are some things here. Number one, remembrance. Remembrance. You remember. You know, you, you just said that thing, you were angry. You did that thing, you were angry. And now you come to an important moment. It may not be in the church. It may be in the church. It may not be in the house. It may be in the house. It may not be in the office, maybe in the office. It may not be in the bus, maybe in the bus. It may not be in a taxi, it may be in the taxi. You just need to offer a petition to the Lord. And that place becomes your altar. And then you remember, you remember that somebody has ought against you. If you didn't remember by yourself, the Holy Ghost brings remembrance. John chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 26, John chapter 14, reading from verse 26, For the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring, how many things? All things to your remembrance and bring all things to your remembrance. If you never remember, this one has thought against you. That one has ought against you. That fellow has ought against you. That sinner has ought against you. 
That child of God has sought against you and you never remember. You don't have the Holy Ghost. You don't have the Holy Ghost. Because if you have the Holy Ghost, it will bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Number one, remembrance. Remembrance. You bring your gift to the altar. And if you bring your gift to the altar and many people have things or wrong things against you and you never remember, it means that you are just like, you know, a dead uh, personality, spiritually dead, and you're offering something to the Lord. It's not even going to accept that. Remember, number one, remembrance. Number two is repentance. Number two, repentance. When something has happened and as an exchange of hot air, an exchange of furious attitude, an exchange of hot words between you and another person, and you are the originator. You were angry, and you said those things. The other fellow is offended. In Luke chapter 17, there is repentance. Luke 17, I'm reading from verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. Control yourself. Watch over yourself. Live a life that is under the control of the Spirit. It says, take heed to yourselves if thy brother trespass against thee. Rebuke him, not in anger. Just point it out. Brother, that's not right. Brother, if I did that to you, it will hurt you. Brother, that's a disturbance. Brother, that's going to stop our progress. Sister, that is going to come in between us. Rebuke her. Rebuke him. And it says, if you repent, forgive him. That has to be repentance. After you remember, there's repentance. And if you trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, what will happen? Say it like you are going to do it. Thou shalt forgive him. You know what? If you don't forgive him, after he comes and he says, I'm sorry about that, I remember. And because you remember, because she remembered, the Holy Ghost sent him, sent her to you. If you don't forgive, now you have a problem with the Holy Ghost. Now you have a problem with the Lord. You must forgive. Number two, repentance. Number three, reconciliation. Reconciliation. We're coming to Matthew chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 24. Leave there thy gift before the altar. Uh, you know, sometimes you hear of, uh, you know, a person, you ask, uh, sister, we didn't see you in church. What happened today? Well, be praying for me. Actually, I'm praying too. My husband was so unhappy with me this morning. My husband was so angry with me this morning. And she locked me in and said, today, you will not go to church. And locked the door and went out. And now he's gone to the church and left me behind deliberately. What kind of anger is this? Or sometimes it's the boisterous woman, strong, that says, man, you said that, you did that, and then locked the husband in and took the key away and came to church. You know those people that their anger has the mastery over them. It's, they're not under control. It's like well or river or stream that is out of control. It just waters everywhere, spoils everything. But it says, leave thy gift before the altar. Go thy way. First, be reconciled to your brother. Reconciliation, reconciliation and talk face to face, and talk a person to the other. And don't be carrying the chips on your shoulders. Don't be carrying the heart in your mind. And don't be carrying the fire, the fire of hatred and anger. 
be reconciled and then you can come and offer your gift. Number one, remembrance. Don't live your life forgetting and trampling on everybody, pushing everybody down, and you never remember anything. Number two, repentance. Number three, reconciliation. Number four, restitution. Restitution. The restitution might be major. The restitution might be minor. It might be over a small scene. It might be over a big scene. It must be done. We're coming to Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. And I'm reading from verse 7. Here are the words of the Lord himself. The Lord who said, I am God, I change not. It says in Genesis chapter 20 verse 7, Now therefore, Restore the man his wife. Abimelech, forget about what the man told you. I'm telling you now this woman is the wife of that man. Forget how this happened. And forget what really transpired between you. I am telling you this is what you do. Restore the man his wife. For he is a prophet. If I have anything to settle with him, he's a prophet, I'll talk to him myself. But your own duty is, restore the man his wife, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. God was talking to the man directly, but God said, I cannot, I cannot heal you, I cannot take the body away, I cannot take the sickness away, even though I'm talking to you directly. And if you ask me, I'm not going to do it, talk to that man, Abraham. You know, when you're healing your health, your strength, your future, your life, it's in the hand of that man. And, you see, and God himself says, go reconcile with him and make restitution. If thou restore her not, thou shalt surely die. Look up here for a moment. You know, this Abimelech, he didn't know anything. It was in chapter 18. Just two chapters before this that God said unto Abraham this Sarah your wife will have a child and there will be laughter in the family his name will be Isaac and now just two chapters after that chapter 20 the man doesn't know the covenant that, all, that the almighty God made with Abraham that is going to have a child and through that child the whole of the families of the earth will be blessed. And Abimelech knew nothing. And then saw a beautiful woman. And then said, I'm going to take the woman. And God said, come on here. You're touching my plan. You're disrupting my plan. I've already decided that that woman is going to have a child. Through that man, Abraham. And Abraham had been believing me. He staggered not at the promise of God. You are destroying my plan. You are a dead man. Very quickly now, restore the man, his wife. You understand? God has plan for every family. He has a plan for you and your first wife, number one. He has a plan for her. And it's not to come inside you. It's not to come to you. You're going to destroy God's plan. And so God says, if my plan is going to work for you, and you're not going to be a dead man. Very quickly now, restore that man is why. Otherwise, you will surely die. And if you die, don't tell me you're righteous. You're going to the other side. You'll go to hell. And all that are thine. Look at verse 14. Verse 14. In verse 14, and Abimelech. Somebody there, if you're there in verse 14, tell me what he did. And Abimelech speak now took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah his wife somebody shout amen, amen. Abimelech was not angry he wasn't doing restitution in anger. Abimelech was not 
having any animosity. He wasn't doing the restitution with malice or animosity. You know why? We know that he called Abraham. And he said, why did you say something like this to me? See what has happened now. And Abraham said, I thought you people are wicked people and you'll kill me for my wife. Well, let's forget about that now. God has told me to restore to you your wife. And I'm going to do it cheerfully. I'm going to do it happily. In fact, I called all my servants here for them to know that I'm doing this at the instruction of God. Not only that, I'll give you sheep, I'll give you oxen, to know that I'm doing this freely. And the restitution is not with hard feeling at all. And I give you men servants. Of the men that are here, they have heard my story. I'm going to give some of them to you. And I'm going to give you women servants. And here is your wife. That's restitution. When you do it with a free heart, a cheerful heart, you have heard from the Lord. It's not that somebody is pushing you and dragging you. If I don't do it, they will not allow me to do this in the church. If I don't do it, not that. You are cheerful about that. Look at verse 17. Before I read verse 17, number one, remembrance. Number two, tell me, repentance. Number three, tell me, reconciliation. Number four, tell me, restitution. Number five, recovery. Recovery. You will recover. Look at verse 17. And Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and it's made servants, and they bear children, miracle will come your way. For the Lord had first closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Recovery. You will recover. Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah chapter 57. I'm reading from verse 18. I see chapter 57, verse 18. I have seen his ways, and I will heal him. I have seen his ways, remembrance, repentance, reconciliation, restitution, recovery. I have seen his ways. He's obedient to my word. He has returned what he had taken from another man. I've seen his ways and will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the leaves. Peace, peace be to him that is afar off and to him that is near, says the Lord. And I will heal you. I will heal you. Recovery for you in Jesus' name. We're looking at Luke. Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. We're looking at verse 8. Luke chapter 19, verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood. And said unto the Lord, unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything. Now you see restitution is not limited to second wife. It's not limited to certificate that is wrongly acquired. It's there, it's there. It's not limited to the money you have stolen that's there. It's not limited to the material things you have taken by force. It's there. If I have taken anything, but you know, it's something greater than money. You have taken money from another person. And when you say you are born again, the Lord is speaking to you. Remember. Repent and reconcile. Make restitution. 
Therein lies your recovery. You have taken something from somebody that generates money for him. You took his business. You took his certificate of incorporation. And you took the thing that gave him authority to earn that money. It's not just that you are returning money. You are returning his business back to him. You took his workers. And you took his servants. Those are the servants that were working for him to give him the money. And then you went behind and you treat those servants. And now you have them. If I've taken anything from anyone, I restore fourfold. Here means that we understand that when you take anything, something tangible. Look at David. He saw Saul lying down and he saw the robe of royalty. And although he didn't kill him, he took out whatever scissors or knife and he cut off the edge of that robe. He spoiled the robe. He took the honor of that king. He took the authority of that king. And he took the identification mark of that king away. Because now you cannot choose the robe. That robe is not complete. And so he now said, O king. And the king said, Who is that? He said, It's your son. Is that your voice, David, my son? And he said, I have been there. And that bottle of water, I'm the one that took it. Look at this. And the garment, look at your garment. It's not any of your people that caught your garment. It's not an accidental thing. I did it. When you take what belongs to another person, maybe the power, maybe the authority, maybe the anointing, maybe the opportunity that belongs to him, and then you stole that, you will restore that. And say, this is what I took illegally. That's restitution. Did you hear when we read Exodus chapter 22? If a man shall steal an ox, if a man that shall steal a sheep, he will restore. But it's not only ox and sheep that people steal. And Absalom stole the hearts of the people. Absalom took away the hearts of the people. He didn't have a chance to make restitution because he died. He died in rebellion. Now he's on the other side. He's in perdition in hell. You will not go there. You will not live with Absalom for all eternity. But if Absalom had a chance... It's not only that, you know, he didn't take sheep, he didn't take oxen, but he stole the hearts of the people. You were restored. What are you doing with their hearts? What are you doing with their person? Because that thing is going to ruin you. It's not meant for you. David is the king. Let him have the hearts of the people. If I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Number one, remembrance. Somebody shout remembrance. Yeah. Number two, repentance. Somebody shout repentance. Yeah. Somebody shout reconciliation. Yeah. And shout restitution. Yeah. And shout recovery. Yeah. Recovery has come for you. Yeah. I said recovery has come for you. Yeah. Number six, renewal. Renewal. Renewal of relationship. Can you see Abraham and Abimelech? They sat together. They talked together. And it says, Abraham, you know, these are some of my finest servants and women servants. You can have this. And the sheep and the oxen. I know you are rich already. I know you are favored already. But all the same, I'm going to be a blessing to your life. We now have a new relationship. Let me show you something. Let me show you something. We're coming back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. 
And I'm reading here from verse 14. This is so important. I'm going to wait for you. Genesis chapter 20. Reading from, tell me the verse. From verse 14. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants. And he gave them unto Abraham. And restored him Sarah his wife. Look at their relationship now. Renewal. Somebody shout renewal. Let me hear you. Renewal. Verse 15. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. The man was not angry. The man was not nursing anger. The man was not regretting giving up Sarah. The man was not saying, okay, you've had that now. You got me to trouble. See what happened to my people. Go your way. No, a renewal of relationship. There's people that say they are making restitution. And then they send out the woman. Okay, your church said, no, it's not the church. It's the Bible. I've read it to you. Okay, if you want to go, you can go. How about the children? You will never see the children again. How about, how am I going to settle down? You're making restitution. You are the one that says you want to go. You can go. How you eat, that's your problem. Where you live, that's your problem. All these cars that you know were available, I could have given you one, I could have given you two, and even given you a driver. But go your way. Restitution, restitution. Okay, you can go. Abimelech was not like that. The restitution was not a point of quarreling or fighting. This is obedience to the Lord. And if you obey the Lord cheerfully, the Lord will bless you in Jesus' name. A renewal and in their relationship, Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleases thee. That's restitution. Dwell where it pleases thee. And now, number one, remember. Number two, repent. Number three, reconcile. Number four, restore, restitute. Number five, recover. Recover in Jesus' name. Amen. Number six, renew. Number seven, return. We're coming to Matthew chapter five. And I'm reading from verse 24. Return, return. In Matthew chapter five, verse 24, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way first be reconciled to thy brother and then come, return, return, return and come and offer thy gift. You return fully to the Lord. Now all that is settled and now I return to serve the Lord and your service to the Lord will be acceptable in his sight in Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen. amen. Point number three now, our dominion and cleansing from anger for eternal happiness. Our dominion, our control, our authority, our power, and cleansing, total cleansing, total freedom from anger so we can have eternal happiness coming to matthew chapter 5 matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 21 ye have heard that it had been said by them of all time thou shalt not kill and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment but i say unto you is the one that has final authority. This is Jesus Christ, our Savior. And this is Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say that raker to his brother, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. 
You see the destination of the people who are living in anger, who are manifesting anger, who are not doing anything about that angry disposition, the fury, the animosity, the fire burning inside them against their brother, against their sister, against their wife, against their husband, against their children, against their parents, against their neighbors, against people around. It says they'll be in danger of hell fire. And if we're going to escape that, thank God you will escape. I said, thank God you will escape and then get to heaven. We must be free from sin and free from anger. We're looking at Job chapter 34. Job chapter 34. And we're reading from verse 31. Job chapter 34. Verse 31, surely it is meet to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement, I will not offend anymore. I will not offend anymore. I will not be angry anymore. I was, say, I was thinking you'll say it aloud. I will not fight anymore. I will not do evil anymore. Verse 32, that which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity by getting angry, getting angry, getting angry, I will do no more. I will do no more. When you say amen, you are just saying that for me. I love that. I love that. The whole blessing, all the promises are mine. It's yours too. The promises are fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. Progress. Somebody shout progress. progress. Success. success. Somebody shout success. success. Happiness. Success. Health. The goodness of God. How does that happen? Look at Psalm 37. And I'm looking at verse 8. Psalm 37, we're looking at verse 8. Cease from anger. That thing is destructive. Cease from anger. That thing causes spiritual suicide. Cease from anger. That thing cuts you away from progress and success. Cease from anger. Forsake cross. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evil doers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Are they there? Yes. You will inherit in Jesus' name. Yes. Proverbs chapter 16. In Proverbs chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 32. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. He that is slow to anger, he that is slow to anger. Hold on for a moment. How are you slow to anger? What does that mean? It's like, you know, somebody is to go out, but he's slow to go out. It's okay, before I go out, I want to pick this. I remember this. I want to do this. Before I go out, it may rain. Where's my umbrella? And he's searching for that. He's slow to go out. How oh, are you slow to anger? You say, okay, anger, no chance now. Wait. I need to think of this. I need to pick this. I need to do that. You're slow to anger. Anger is saying, I want to come in. Say, you can't come in now. I want to talk to that person. I, I had something nice. I wanted to telephone and tell so and so. And then you pick up the phone and you say something nice. By the time you, you know, do this and you're slow, anger is knocking and there's no chance. I need to do that other thing. Eventually, anger would say, the man is not ready for me today. He's wasting my time. Anger will get angry and go. 
I said anger will get angry and go. Don't give anger the first chance to enter when it wants to enter. Do other things. Say other things. Go in another way. Go in another direction. As you delay that anger, you are slow to anger. Anger will vanish away. And all the defeat is going to bring to your life, it will carry all this defeat to another corner. Victory has come for you. Dominion has come for you. He that is low to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth a spirit than he that taketh a city. Anger will not be your friend. Anger will not be your tenant. Anger will not live inside you. Will not destroy you. Anger will not be your partner in life. Goodness and mercy will follow you. All the days of your life. Anger will be a stranger. Will never sleep with you at night in Jesus name. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 8. Better is the end of a sin than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. Don't be in such a hurry to destroy yourself. Don't be in such a haste to destroy the plan of God for you. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. I will not be a fool. I said, I will not be a fool. You will not be a fool in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. Acts, chapter 9. We're reading from verse 3. Acts, chapter 9. I'm reading here from verse 3. In Acts chapter 9, verse 3, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the ground, to the earth, and had a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. What does that mean? When you get angry against a child of God, you are angry at Christ. When you are furious against a believing wife, a saintly husband, you're furious against Christ and he's asking you, why? Are you manifesting anger against me, your savior? Understand, when the temptation comes to be angry, it's not that woman, it's not that man, it's not that person, it's Christ. And he's saying what you've done to them, you are doing to me. You will not be angry at Christ. I said you will not be angry at Christ. Yeah. What will Christ do that you say, I'm angry at Jesus Christ. But you know, if you are angry against your brother, against your sister, it's against the Lord. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25 verse 40. In Matthew chapter 25 verse 40, And the king shall say, and so and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, you've done it unto me. If you are nice to them, it's unto me. If you have affection and love for them, it's unto me. If you have anger against any of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Look at verse 45. Then shall he answer them, saying, 
Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. Inasmuch as you said, I'm going to withdraw my favor, I'm going to withdraw my fellowship, I'm going to withdraw my service, I'm going to withdraw my skill from him, from her, because I'm angry. You have done it against the Lord. You have withdrawn that thing away from the Lord. Jesus said, you are angry against your brother. You are angry against me. You are furious against your brother, against your sister. It's against me. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. What grieves the Holy Spirit? For such a one, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, all those things, they grieve the Spirit of God. You will not grieve the Spirit of God. For such a one, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. You'll do that. You throw them away. You throw them into the depths of the sea. They're not float to come back to your life again. Anger is forever gone. But start to chew and be ye kind one to another and be kind one to another tender hearted forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you with this your success has come your progress has come happiness today happiness tomorrow Happiness forever. Live a new life. Take away that anger. Take away that malice. Throw it away. And now you are free. Where's the free person there? I said you are free. I said you are free. Rise up in that freedom. Rise up in that freedom. And enjoy the freedom. And exercise the freedom and love the freedom and operate your life in that freedom no more anger no more anger you remember that somebody has something against you because of what you said because of what you did because of the anger because of the fury this will be the final time now go back to that person and repair reconcile make necessary restitution you will recover and then there'll be a renewal in your life and return serving the Lord without any hindrance. Open your mouth and pray. Open your mouth and pray. Recollect, recollect, remember. Look at your past life and look at the way you have been living your life. Anger here, anger there, violence there, strife there, complaints there, murmuring there, fury there, violence there. Bury everything here today and say, Lord, cleanse me in the blood of the Lamb. Make me free. Set me free, keep me free.